next speaker is uh, Professor Don Fabu, uh, and he's going to be talking about communicating with uh, people with uh, with uh, disabilities such as deafblind. <laughs> Thank you very much, and of course I want to thank Jay, all of the organizers, Ted, and in the larger sense, um, University Scholars Program, NUS, and Singapore, for many years ago, taking a chance on me and let me kind of create a, a chaotic network of my own, which is called International Society for Biosemiotic Studies. Now, I'm not going to talk about a lot of biosemiotics today, except to explain to you what biosemiotics is. Biosemiotic studies sign systems. Right? which means we're studying living things because dead things don't use signs, right? unless we program signs into dead things. Uh, but all living things, uh, all perception, every sight, every sense, everything that an animal senses is only useful to it if it tells it something about reality, if it stands for the real world, the way things are. There's predator, there's prey, there's food, there's a stage, there's my reflection in the mirror, there's my tombstone. So... Science systems are actually ubiquitous throughout the living world, uh, and generally biosemioticians are interested in the science systems of animals, the science systems of ecosystems, uh, and not too much on cultural human systems like language. That's something we kind of leave to the anthropologists, the cultural theorists. But as I was doing my work last year, I came across a man, a Singaporean named Abraham Liu. And Abraham had, um, was born with vision and, and sight, with vision and hearing, but he had gone blind about 20 years ago, and when I had met him, he had just turned deaf for about a year. I'm not sure if you can really even picture what his experience is like. Really kind of pitch blackness and no sound ever. And the only kind of way a human could get into Abraham's world was through touch. When the moon was touching him, no one was there for Abraham. Now, the deafblind are an interesting population. They're a small population, fortunately. Uh, however, they're underserved, of course, because if you're blind, there's many, many technologies available to you to compensate for your inability to see the world, right? You can hear the world, which is a lot, and you can hear what's going on in people's voices, you can hear their prosody, you can hear when they're angry with you, you can hear them enter the room, you can um, cross the street with these um, sounds that uh, different things make that have been designed to help the blind people, and similarly, if you're deaf but you can see, of course, you can read people's lips, you can watch their faces, you can read the internet. Uh, but the deaf, blind, all of those other technologies build on the remaining sense. The deaf, blind don't have either of those senses, so the deaf, blind are in a, a kind of a, a hard position. When I met Abraham, like most deaf, blind people, he developed a system of what they call home signs, not really a, a formal system of signs. And what he asked me to do was to help him develop a sign system that would be more um, effective than what he was currently using. So I'll show you what Abraham and most deaf blind people who actually have gone through uh, normal education and know how to use the alphabet, they often communicate, they'll use this as their sign system. Uh, you'll see Abraham now is trying to ask um, how, who's filming him right now? And uh, the answer is a tripod is filming him. And this is how the interaction um, runs. Find him. Find him. Find him. Find him. Find him. Watch the hands. this was very laborious, very time-consuming, to have people kind of write letters on his hand. Of course, everyone makes the letters differently. Uh, his hand gets sore after a certain time, and it's very slow. 
So we began to build a, a science system for Abraham. Starting, we had to start with the alphabets because that's what uh, he was uh, conversant in. And I don't know if he'd been in an SMA, so he knew Morse code. So we, we built for Abraham a device, a transmitting device, just using things we could find in stores, like a wireless uh, BlackBerry and these um, microelectromechanical actuators, which would just simply make pulses, right? All we had to do was get a pulse onto his fingertip. Now, the fingertip is one of the places where your body has the most nerves of all. If you see the, the sensory homunculus, you'll see we're mostly fingertips and mouths. That's how we know the world, really, as, as animals. Um, so we would be able to transmit, by using this little cap here, electrical pulses into, uh, into the, onto Abraham's fingertip. So this would be T, E, D, Ted. If nothing else, it kind of, it freed up the space that he was being used here that was becoming very irritated. It allowed the process to go faster because he didn't have to guess R, no, P, no, T. He was able to kind of quickly get a hold of this. Uh, but in point of fact, that really didn't get us the kind of full interaction that people want to have with other human beings, right? So we started looking at other instances of language use. And we decided to look at people who use language normally, as they say, as well as uh, taking the kind of a Mary through the ball to John, how should we design the device? We started to look at people like infant language. How do mothers and, and children that don't have language, they're communicating, how do they communicate? Carlos? And watch the eye gaze here. <laughs> They both synchronize their eye gaze perfectly with each other, right? So eye gaze is an important part of human interaction. I'm not showing you all the clips we have, they, they take too long. Uh, things like this are an important part of human interaction. There's a Portuguese speaker and a Korean speaker. Okay, so hand gestures and kind of making pictures of things in the world are important uh, way of, of communication. And we do, we always use gestures when we're talking to each other, even on the phone. We're using gestures, as I'm using gestures, as we speak as part of the language. It's not something extraneous to it. And we look at people with aphasia. One of the most famous aphasia long-term studies was done by Chuck Goodwin in the United States, who studied a man named Chill. Now, Chill had a stroke and was left with the ability to only use three words, yes, no, and and. And when he came out of his stroke, the doctor said, chill is a vegetable, he'll never be able to function. But in point of fact, he went on to live another 20 years, go down to the Starbucks, order exactly the drink he wanted, and tell jokes without having any words. Because he was able to use the words and the interactive skills of the people around him. So here's a few, a one minute clip of chill, trying to make himself understood. And it's interesting how he goes about it. When we went with Mac and June, we, we sat at a table just as we came in the front door. We sat with them there. And then, so five of us can fit there. Six o'clock. Five people. Seven? Seven o'clock? No. Six o'clock. Seven people. Five? Seven people. Is that six? Two? Seven? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Invite somebody? Yes. Yeah. Mac and June? Yes. Oh. Oh. Kind of like, oh. Interesting spit take there. Um, what Charles Goodman is able to show by slowing this down is the fact that uh, Chill is actually using the words of others to get his language across. But he couldn't do that unless certain sequential structures were in shape. It also shows us that the signs themselves don't carry meaning. Is it five? Is it stop? Is it five people? Is it five o'clock? Meaning can't exist just in a simple word. Mary, through the ball to John. This is a kind of an artifact of our, our way of writing language down, or a kind of notation, as it were. Notation is not music, as I think Ty made a very good point. And when we're listening to music, we don't know what the others are listening to, as Ty also made a good point. So his talk actually reminded me of many things that we found going on in language use. So we realized what we were going to have to do was we are going to have to kind of change this the simplistic device that we had um, come up with to account for how language really is. Language isn't like this. When you really talk to someone, it's like this. With all this, uh, well, uh, ask. And we used to think that this stuff was disfluency. Well, this is just a speaker having trouble making their utterance. 
But when you watch a lot of interaction, you realize, no, that stuff, that stuff that seems to be junk, is not noise in the signal. It's signal, right? People are aligning to that. This is a hesitation marker. This is the transition-relevant place. I'm telling you, you can come in now. This is a hedge to set up another um, perturbation, which is to get your attention in case it's lagging. People do this with their eyes. They do this with raising the sound of their voice. They do this with the tempo of their speaking. They do this with ellipsis. Right? So there's all these things that we used to think were non-linguistic that actually are necessary for making meaning. And these are the kind of things that we, that we realized we we're going to have to build into this device besides just the alphabetic part. We're going to have to somehow find a way to put in emphasis. Now, even in text messages, you do this. You cap, put things in caps when you're yelling, right? And things like emoticons. And it's interesting to watch how these new languages, these new kind of thumb text languages, try to build in all of this stuff. Smile, thumb up, all of this stuff. It's not just to save text characters. No one is really calculating how many cents per character they're using, right? It's to make it more natural. So the emoticons, emphasis, how does, how does Abraham know when we're following his joke and nodding our head and laughing along with the joke and our smile is increasing? As we need to know when we're telling a joke, we realize our joke's not going over well and then maybe in mid-joke we'll change our, our, our technique. Right? So emphasis, emoticons, ellipsis. What's not said in conversation is just as important as what is said. Again, like music, it's the silences that really make the beat. All of this has to, you can't get this just from alphabetic letters. And the environment. Who's engaging now? Who has just left the room? Who is in the room? Where are we focused right now? All of these things we realize would have to be somehow built in a way that its sender would not break the flow of their, the message they want to send, but would able to give Abraham a more kind of realistic, a more natural communication with the world. Because let's face it, look how much of the world's been taken away from him. Again, it's, it's hard for you to imagine. If you close your eyes, you can get there. If you close your ears, you can get there. Maybe if you spend some time in an isolation chamber with no physical sensation, after which time many people quickly start to go insane, the mind starts to unravel without the environment keeping us in the world, keeping us sane, and keeping us connected with one another. So we're trying to do this to deepen the experience that Abraham could get through the messages that were being sent, but unfortunately, in February of this year, Abraham finally um, died of a brain tumor. The same tumor they found out subsequently that it, that it caused his deafness. Well, one of the last things that he, uh, he communicated to his wife to tell somebody was that he hoped that this research could go on. So the machine we were building stopped, and there's really no other um, person we're working with at the moment. So that, that, that part of the research has gone on hold. But in going back and watching, Abraham's interaction and watching how he also, much like him and Chill are kind of mirror images, right? Chill can see everything and hear everything, but he has no access to this verbal system. Abraham has access to the system and nothing else without it. So in any, any time we see, we do a knockout study in genetics or a neurologist will look at someone who can only see half a visual field, we actually learn more, not just about those people, but about ourselves. But what really we need to do to be seeing and talking and acting in the world. So we're going back now and looking at Abraham's data and trying to find out more about the fine-grained mechanics of, of human interaction, or as we say in biosemiotics, human semiosis, human meaning making, human message sending and message receiving and acting on those messages. So while I, uh, I kind of deliberately mislabeled this talk as developing assistive communication technology to the deaf blind, because that's what I thought I was doing when I started the project. I realize now that the real name of the talk is learning about the nature of language from the language of the language impaired. And that's one of the legacies that Abraham has left us, so I want to thank him right now. Thank you, Abraham. <laughs>